Welcome to New Realities. I'm Alan Steinfeld, and tonight's a very special broadcast because it commemorates the 40th anniversary of, of an experience that shook the world and changed the level of consciousness and vibration that exists in our physical and metaphysical dimension. Forty years ago today, on January 2nd, 1973, Dr. J.J. Hertog was taken to a higher level of consciousness, and we're going to go into what that means, but it was from that experience that he was able to write this classic spiritual text, The Book of Knowledge, The Keys of Enoch. So on the show tonight, I'll be talking with Dr. J.J. Hertog and his wife, Dr. Desiree Hertog, about this extraordinary experience and what has happened over the last 40 years and how the Keys of Enoch have influenced our spiritual culture really from its inception. And not only that, but there's been so much that the Keys predicted that have been fulfilled in these last 40 years. Stay tuned for this very exciting discussion. Dr. Hertog and Desiree Hertog, welcome to New Realities. Yes, we're very pleased to be here with our worldwide audience. Again, we thank you for this exceptional time that we have to broadcast to colleagues in more than 70 countries worldwide. And indeed, this is the 40th anniversary today of the exceptional experience I call a consciousness-changing experience that I had of having a contact with the divine intelligence that led to the publication of the Book of Knowledge, Keys of Enoch. Well, it's truly a remarkable event that happened to you, um, California. I mean, it, for people who aren't familiar, and there might be some people who aren't so familiar with the Keys, if you can just recap, Dr. Hertog, exactly what it was that you were doing in order for this experience to have taken place of this um, awakening of consciousness that happened in, with you. So if you would just relay some of that experience. Yes, of course. For many, many years as a student of uh, archaeology, culture, history, linguistics, and oriental science, I had been looking really for answers to some of the perennial questions connected with the possibility of a higher life in the universe behind the manifestations of all of the great myths, theologies, legends, and stories regarding the Tree of Life. And I had acquired knowledge of the ancient languages, and so I was putting together a methodology of using the sacred mantras or sacred expressions in the ancient Hebrew, the Aramaic, the Sanskrit, in a combination of sounds. And having a background also in musicology, I felt I could create, as it were, a soundscape whereby possibly in deep prayer and meditation, some of these answers could be magnified and clarified for me. And at that particular point on January 2nd, 1973, a tremendous morphogenic door opened as a result of the energies that I was building in prayer and musical meditation. And at that point, I stepped into the future and I was gone for a period of two days. When I came back, my students noticed that there was light around my body. And, of course, the rest is history. This uh, document was very carefully prepared to go out to uh, leading thinkers in the academic community, the scientific community. It was a testimony to the reality of other worlds. It was a testimony to the fact that we share in something beyond this physical existence and dimension. We are co-participants in the higher evolutionary process. Dr. Hertog, before you go there uh, to that next point, can you just describe a little bit more of your journey? You said as you were building up to this experience, you created a soundscape, a uh, intoning of certain words, and then a doorway opened to this higher dimension, and then the angelic being, Enoch, appeared, and then Metatron appeared. But can you describe what it was actually like with your body to travel through these dimensions. And then at one point you said you left your body and put on a garment of light because your physical body could not go to these other levels of, and dimensions. So I'd love to hear you describe the actual feelings and sensations that you were experiencing as you were taken up to these higher levels of 
interdimensional space. In, in, in a few words, it was an overwhelming experience that cannot be put in human language. It was an experience that I think the mystical texts speak of indirectly when they speak of how the mind begins to connect with the greater universe when the mind realizes all things are interconnected and when the mind and body is taken in a field of light that is of a different order, a different creative dimension, in this case a superluminal process is evoked through which you do not feel so much the sensations of the physical self but you begin to realize that the mind, body and spirit are connected in very special ways. You begin to discover the divine spark that is within each and every one of us on Mother Earth that is connected with different realms of glory. And this process of going into the greater light, which was done in what we will call milliseconds of human time, I experienced a tremendous array of colors, sounds, and experiences through which I was literally biolocated into the different realms. And in that physical dimension, without the light protection, my physical body would not have survived just because of the biophysical and the larger paraphysical energy fields that I was crossing over into, not of my own will, not of my own power. And certainly no man can see the divine unless a divine garment is placed around his mind, his body. But that essentially took place. And I found myself in a higher dimensional reality that is simply beyond words. And is that is the reason I wrote my book in a meta language or a language of a language, which means you have to be able to think holistically and bring together a inner language of music with a higher language of conceptual order. The conceptual rational language cannot explain something of a higher creative order. So was there any fear uh, or was it more the feeling of, of love, as you say? Was there any human element that may have contracted about this experience? No, the awesomeness of the experience was that of unconditional love, supreme love. I cannot explain it any better than what is spoken of in the book known as the Keys of Enoch, that the whole body began to vibrate with love. And I saw through scenario abstracts the fact that we are connected with other evolutionary orders and that we as a human community were being prepared for a time of graduation some would call it a quantum leap into the future. Others would simply call it going up into the next branch of the tree of life. It was the power and the majesty of this experience that propelled me as it has over the last 40 years, which is a very remarkable gematria of time and space, to go to the various countries of the world and share with them knowledge, keys of knowledge, that unlock secrets of earlier archaeological cycles, cultural, scientific periods of greater evolutionary process, as well as information codes that connect with the higher evolutionary mind of the universe. And hi, Alan, this is uh, Desiree Hertak here. What I think is so exciting about the Keys of Enoch is the fact that 40 years ago, Dr. Hertak was told that there was an upgrade or a programming taking place for planet Earth, and we would come to understand things that happened in the past, things that are happening now, and things of where we're moving into. So, And that some of the information, really, of higher science, of higher consciousness, would be given to this planet so we could be prepared for that ultimate interconnectedness with other realms of intelligence. And I think that this has really happened and taken place in the last 40 years, and we see this in many realms of science and consciousness development, archaeology, all areas of learning on this planet. Well, the book itself, it was a two-day experience, but the book probably takes, you know, a, a month to read, and it's so multidimensional. I mean, as you say, it takes place on seven levels of understanding, at least. The, I'm curious, then, how were you able to encapsulate the experience into the words that became the book itself? Well, I had, of course, a training and background as an academic as a scholar, as a writer, and so I was able really to verbalize into a recorder my experiences from which I then transposed into written language. And I would like to simply read the opening statement of the Book of Knowledge to our world audience. 
the underlying fire in which the Father of the kingdom of the heavens has kindled in the midst of the holy tree of life is burning fiercely in the innermost heart of the world. Its blazing flames will illuminate the people to speak prophetically and to reveal the great healing power that will bring all people of the earth into a realization of the externalization of the divine hierarchy of all the masters who serve the eternal father. This opening statement, this point of departure is the realization that there is in the process a healing between the different languages, religious and cultural traditions that have ignored the reality that there is a living divine mind behind all of the layers of information, knowledge, and wisdom traditions that in some instances has prevented the human from entering into a higher level of experience, of what? direct face-to-face -face contact. Right, and so in a certain sense what we're saying is that uh, humanity now who feels that everything is all on this planet and that there's no higher consciousness existing, and that's not the humanity of the people listening to this program or your shows, but the average person nowadays uh, you know, has like neglected a lot of those higher realities in their daily lives. And that's really hurting us in the sense of cutting us off from higher levels of expansion that we really should all be experiencing. So that's extremely important. I just want to go back, Alan, for, for a minute. Um, yeah, so when Dr. Hertak uh, came back from that experience, as it was January 2nd and 3rd, he was uh, in an academic environment, and he started to share this with his students. And so with his students, he went through each of the keys. He came back from his experience with the calligraphy from the book already done. And that was very, very quickly, I mean, probably in a week or of, of his experience, he had like these, um, the calligraphy printed out. And then uh, he started going through each of them. And as he went through them, then those were transcribed and ultimately then put into the Keys of Enoch. So it was very fresh in his mind. But I think the important thing is, what he saw were scenario abstracts. They weren't words. I mean, this is not channeling, as you know. This is right. not someone saying a word. These are experiences that he actually saw, and then he relayed. And that's, that's really the key to this, that it's not an automatic writing or it's not channeling. And, in fact, he was sitting in a group of people and saying, you know, this is what I experienced. This is what I saw. This is, you know, what, they, what I was told when I was there. So it's that type of information that then went into the body of the text. Well, you were one of the first people to actually see him when he came back. Can you describe what you noticed about him when you saw him back then well, in 73? Right, right. Prior to the time of his experience, you know, he had some of the information of he was interested in archaeology, he was interested in biofeedback, you know, things that were going on in the uh, early 70s. But uh, when he came back, it was totally a different scenario. He had actually put it all together. And actually, it scared some of the students. Uh, so in a certain sense, uh, some of the more traditional academic students who were there were really kind of taken back. And yet he was attracting a whole other level of people who were really interested in this higher knowledge and this higher information. So, and there were a lot of experiences surrounding him at that time uh, that not only I, but many of the other students saw in terms of beings of light, in terms of light, we'll say light ships uh, in the night, he would take people out and, you know, see certain experiences and various other things that did take place around him. Very, quite profound. Well, I, also, Dr. Hurt, can you talk about the character of Enoch and then you also say you met Metatron? What was it to be in the presence of these beings? I mean, yes, love, but was there a distinct quality to Enoch and to Metatron? Understand that these experiences happen in a fraction of time where the mind is overwhelmed by the amount of information being fed into the mind, but a certain sense of humility, of nakedness, and being in the presence of we will call the higher angelic forms or cosmic teachers of the universe that serve the divine mind of creation. It was a overwhelming sense of humility and also in this deep sense of realizing that there is in the beatific vision a reality of a higher divine family that is 
so powerful and so loving that is behind many of the higher advanced experiences. Enoch told me he could only take me so far and it was up to Metatron or Shaddai to take me to the higher realms. And again, I say this very carefully for our audience throughout the world. This is not something that I want to go into in detail because it is an appointed experience that everyone will have in their own way, in their own time, and cannot be described in poetic language or even in scientific language. It is something that is completely off the scale of what the mind would normally experience in terms of being a vehicle or a vessel of divine love in the ultimate sense of love with capital letters. But I think what's really exciting as well is when Dr. Ocheka was saying some of this, he also gives a cosmology behind this information. And so Enoch is connected with our local universe, or what we call the SON Sun universe. And then Metatron is connected with the next level of reality, what we would call the Father universe. And so there's these various orders and relationships. And I think for people who come from just strictly a angelic or Kabbalistic background, uh, there's a lot of confusion. Is Metatron and Enoch the same being? And according to Dr. Herdak's experience, they're not exactly the same being, but they're different emanations of energy uh, working on different frequencies. So Metatron is able to be closest to the throne. That's where the name comes from, also known as El Shaddai, meaning the Almighty in the Hebrew, where Metatron is more of a Greek term uh, for the same entity. And Enoch would be that which had walked here on this planet and yet was the first to experience ascension. And so that's a, an emanation or an energy that's separate from Metatron in the sense of being in this reality. Well, the beauty of the book is that, first of all, it's very symbolic, but it also combines astrophysics with um, bi biology, with ancient civilizations and ancient languages, and um, kind of gives a new direction for a multidimensional cosmology. Enoch said to you, Dr. Hurtak, over the next 30 years, many of the revelations that have been presented to you and that experience would, would come to light, would come into manifestation. Let's go over some of the, um, the things that, in a sense, that were predicted. As Carl Sagan once said, uh, exceptional claims require really exceptional documentation or science. And in the Book of Knowledge is a code book of future science. It's, it's uh, read by those who have in some ways, very specialized preparation. In practical language, I'd like to review some of the confirmations, beginning with the confirmation of zero-point energy that we've picked up on in recent times. The keys in 1973 speak of the zero-point energy field as a source of future energy. Now, what key is that, if I'm looking along key. in the key? T302. What's really interesting is that uh, at the time of the keys in the 1970s, I mean, people were still trying to figure out the energy behind a pyramid. They were trying to understand there were planets around stars. We didn't realize that stars had cycles of birth. We didn't, there was a lot of information that we take for granted now uh, that really was not uh, present at the time. So when the keys came out, many, many people were completely overwhelmed. So this section that Dr. Urtek is going to quote now for key 302 on free energy or zero-point energy. Yes, 302, verse 13. For those of you throughout the world who have the text, I'm reading halfway through verse 13. This universal zero-point where the cones of force come together as a point of original attachment to other universal systems through which creation takes place. Secondary systems of physical creation must acknowledge the universal zero point as the origin of galactic matter. This is uh, explained in other parts of the book, but essentially it is putting a, a benchmark on this very important area. Nature magazine, as you know, one of the greatest magazines around in terms of science, came out with an article called The Observation of the Dynamic Casimir Effect in a Superconducting Circuit by Christopher Wilson and his colleagues. And actually, they were the first to actually be able, and this is really fascinating because people talk about ZPE for free energy and they're looking forward to that and some people claim that they've already gotten it. But Wilson and his colleagues were able to prove that zero point really does take place. 
he was able to do something what's called the dynamic Casimir effect, where he was able to really bring in what's called virtual photons or energies of light that aren't here, that aren't the physical light. He was able to bring them from this other state of matter and actually hold them here. So that's exactly what we're talking about, that uh, these subatomic particles that form out of nothing actually are able to, to come into this reality and be here, and we can use that as an energy field, as a free energy field. And this has now been confirmed by this research of Christopher Wilson in Nature Magazine. You know, other people perhaps have been able to do this and haven't gotten what? into Nature Magazine. Yeah, I'm just reading that part again in the keys here. It says, uh, systems of physical creation must acknowledge the universal zero point as the origin of galactic matter in the same way a child acknowledges the cord of his mother's womb out of which he is extended. So you're saying that the, the matter itself is connected to a greater reality, kind of time-space continuum that goes beyond this Local. Yes, exactly, and that uh, our key to the understanding of the background energy out of which all things are forged and formulated is the universal zero point that is crucial in our understanding of the new cosmology. In other words, the keys of Enarch are giving us scientific predictions of what will come to pass within a 30-year period of time. And but these, when you wrote this, you did not really... Um, you were just going with your feeling, but you didn't have the science. You were you were sort of um, just a, a forerunner of this thought. I mean, right? He saw these things in another reality, but you know they weren't confirmed down here. And again, this whole zero point, as I said, many people have been uh, playing with using. It's really the connection to other realms. You know, we're in this balance here. You can't take energy out of our system. You can't hard to put any energy back in or anything like that. Everything's in the kind of this, this state of matter. But the idea of zero point is you can pull it in from other realities and the whole concept that there are other realities from which to pull it from and to use that energy that created this world in a certain sense to, to uh, tap into for free energy is an amazing phenomena. And that's really what, that's one of the, we'll say the top levels of free energy research that can be done. Even oh. Egg Mitchell talks about that. Aspect. Even zero point energy can be used as a form of energy technology to go between uh, solar systems and even different areas of our galaxy. So there's also an added, shall we say, caveat here in terms of how the higher intelligence called in the keys of Enoch, the higher evolution, or the B'nai, or the sons of light, can actually use this zero-point energy as a propulsion system, if I can call it that, to connect different parts of the but, universe. So, so you're saying, obviously, there's different dimensional spaces or worlds, and through the Casimir effect, which they prove works, you can tap into these um, the spaces that feed each other, in a sense, where we're... we're well, the Cosmere effect fed. is the, the yes. first benchmark in recognizing there's something there. This has been taken into account by Robert Forward and scientists of the American Air Force. They've been experimenting with the applications behind the scenes. This is all in areas that are highly sensitive. But I'm saying to you, the keys of Enoch bring together the connecting points of celestial movement, yeah. hyperspace travel, with the historic points of contact where earlier civilization was, shall we say, bootstrapped or brought up to higher evolutionary levels. And in P215, there's a world map that has 12 longitudinal lines that connect with key areas of the world that in the last 30 years, anthropologists have found evidence of an earlier evolutionary process, namely the Homo sapiens sapiens was not alone. There were other life forms. And this is a clue to the reality that our planet is a experimental schoolhouse for well, but, not only the physical advancement but also the spiritual advancement of the human race. The two go hand in hand and we've reached a point now the consciousness evolution of the spiritual domain and the physical scientific evolution of the new science of the mind are converging. We are reaching a critical mass right now. We're going to see unbelievable things unfolds, I believe, in the next uh, portion of our decade as more and more hearings take place throughout the governments of the world, more disclosure 
conferences and documents come forth saying that we're not alone, that we've been carefully nurtured and carefully incubated to come to your own senses. Yeah, think of it, Alan, if I can say that there were basically at least three hominoid species here on the planet, we'll say at the very beginning of our growth cycle. And that's the Neanderthals, the Homo florensius, which some people say is like the Homo erectus, but in small form, and us, the Homo sapiens. So there's three species already on our planet. Think of how many other planets and other species are out there in space. I, I think uh, Dr. Jack feels from his experience and also from his uh, research and say there's at least 70 extraterrestrial races. Oh, at least. Um, I have a philosophical question for you, Dr. Hertog. When you were given this knowledge uh, in 1973, did it, seem, um, did it seem so unbelievable to you back then that the world would move in this direction of higher consciousness and higher light because the world was different that back then and we've come into a spiritual renaissance I'd say in the last 10 or 20 years that wasn't really seen in the 70s there may be a beginning in the 60s but not really it didn't really crystallize and it still is but yeah I think that's a good question I saw an upper spiral of knowledge and a downward spiral of the old programming the old scripting allowing a portion of the human race to go on its unconscious level, disregarding its impact upon nature, its misuse of science, its splitting of information dualistically so that one side of the brain was not able to compute what the other side was doing. I saw really that humanity was being tested and would reach a breaking point where we would have to get on our knees and pray that divine intelligence would help us overcome some of these problems that would see the demise of large numbers of the human race. And I have say this with great love to the world audience. These questions are, so we say, on the outer extremes of the more important body of knowledge, which is the love letter of the divine speaking to us. And this is why we have an academy for future science, why we have study groups, why we have a library of information and music, because without the music, without the training of the mind and the development of consciousness to work multidimensionally. We're simply talking jargon. We're simply talking words for the sake of words without the nuances of color, inner meanings, and the richness of how many traditions from east to west, from north to south are being brought together. So so we can shift the balance, and I think that's the important thing. The information is being given to us. That's what Dr. Hertak saw and experienced, as well as other people also now bringing it forward. But the question is, what do we do with it? And uh, whether people in India are able to move forward in a positive way with it or still choose to sleep and remain more in their own egos, or that doesn't help the planet in any way. I know, Alan, we all just recently experienced the uh, December 21st, and hopefully yeah. we're in a new era that allows humanity to really see the importance of moving and working together and being together and trying to be more harmonious and helpful to one another and to all of Mother Earth. Well, I have to say I was just with J.J. Hertog and Dr. Jezere Hertog in Mexico on December 21st at the Great Pyramid of Chichen Itza. And there seems to have been some kind of a shift in that experience where these thousands of people were awaiting a, a threshold of transformation. And since then, I feel this grounding of energy. I feel more solid in my body and I think something did happen. I think the human race sort of passed through a doorway, a portal, and and how it relates to the Keys of Enoch experience is that I feel we as a collective are ascending to some of the places that you were in touch with, Dr. Hertog, in that initial experience, that we collectively are moving into that space Indeed. In fact, after the 30-year period of the United States government, I am told by some of the information now coming out through disclosure, was to have released certain documentation regarding the fact that we're not alone in the universe and that we have been brought into a transitional period to reevaluate all areas of science, knowledge, theology, and cosmology. So this is a, a very important conversation we're having with academies throughout the world, from South Africa to Australia and Japan to Europe, to all of the Americas, that we are 
to work as a team, bringing together the practical side of developing a higher fellowship through unconditional love and also with a recognition to the historic symbol of the tree of life to realize the many branches of knowledge also extend to the galactic family of creation, the branches of which go even beyond our galaxy to the super, super galaxies of a living dynamic universe as key 118 tells us God's plan has no end in his life in the house of many mansions. It's with the realization that we have now that we must change our physical sciences, our, we must change our astronomy, astrophysics to be more aware of what's coming this way. Right. So can you tell people how they can actually use the keys? Because it's such a multidimensional, uh, beautiful piece of, of work that um, I think it helps for people to have some um, guide in how they can apply this to their lives. I recently published a book called The 72 Living Divine Names of the Most High. It is a a text that brings together a, a understanding of the Hebrew, the Aramaic language, but also emphasizes 72 key expressions found in the Old and New Testament, both in the Hebrew and the, the Aramaic, but also the Greek New Testament that provides really the mantra-like seat syllables, so important for raising consciousness and preparing for conversations. Right, and we also have, as you know, Alan, the Overself Awakening, which we just released in Spanish as well, down in uh, Mexico, uh, December 21st to 23rd. The Overself Awakening actually has the Keys of Enoch throughout it in 72 chapters, and it's a very personal experience of growth based on the cosmology of the Keys of Enoch. But basically, just for those who haven't been familiar with our work too well that may be listening, we do have Academy for Future Sciences throughout the world, from Europe to South Africa, connect with Australia and South America and Mexico and, of course, the U.S. and Canada. And we do ha- encourage people who really want to study to join some of our groups that are taking place in terms of study because there's nothing like sharing together and working together in terms of learning this cosmology. In addition to that, we have many music tapes for personal growth and understanding using sacred language. And we do feel the sacred language is very important for keeping the higher consciousness going in our lives. So as the prophet Daniel tells us in chapter 12 of his scroll, this is the time of the speeding up of knowledge. And we encourage our our listeners out there to realize that we're coming out all the time with new films, new reports, scientific papers, and uh, we have just completed a marvelous musical CD with Stephen Halpert, who was my student some 40 years ago, a leading musical composer in the world entitled Sacred Name, Sacred Codes, where I, as the cantor or the major singer, intone some of these sacred expressions in a way that our musically interested audience can catch on. You go to keysofenoch.org, scroll down to our publications and music, and I would certainly encourage this new CD, which we've just completed as of the 1st of January. It's a marvelous experience of how to raise consciousness very quickly, how to use music as a learning tool, how to recognize also we're working with other key musicians throughout the world to build really a movement of musicians, a movement of cultural artists and specialists in terms of cross-cultural participation on a much higher level of involvement with our cosmic counterparts. Right, and we're also on Facebook under Keys of Enoch Group, and we're going to, Dr. Attack would like to uh, probably start some Twitter activity maybe once a week with some positive thoughts on Keys of Enoch uh, for Twitter. So these are things that we're developing. As- I want people to also hear some of the musical inspiration that has come out of the keys. There's so much beautiful sounds and inspiration and songs that have been written. So here's just some of the great music and and meditative and inspirational sounds that comes from the Keys of Enoch and the Academy of Future Science. Thank you both for your time. I've been talking to Dr. J.J. Hurtock and Dr. Desiree Hurtock about their classic text, The Keys of Enoch, Book of Knowledge. 
a couple of DVDs that have been released that you can order at the Keys of Enoch website as well. Ellen, why didn't you mention the names of these? Because these are very important. The most recent one is Pathways to Conscious Living with Joe Dispenza and Marilyn Schlitz and the doctors I'm talking to, J.J. Hurtock and Desiree Hurtock and myself as narrator. And then I, we've done a dialogue called Codes of Life, uh, which was uh, two half-hour programs about life in the cosmos and the potential of consciousness to exist throughout and they can order from my website as well, newrealities.com. If you have any questions, you can email me at newrealities at earthlink.net and check my website, newrealities.com. Thank you for listening.